and welcome back. It's the France 24 debate and I'm Annette Young. He's called the accountant of Auschwitz. A 93-year-old Oskar Groding is standing trial in the German town of Lundberg, <coughs> charged with complicity in the murder of some 300,000 Holocaust victims. It's been seen as a hugely symbolic act. This as authorities make a last-ditch attempt to put the handful of remaining Nazi death camp guards in the dock before they die. Now, given the age of people such as Groening, what does such a trial achieve? And do the moral lessons from such a judicial exercise resonate with the younger generation across Europe? And with me to discuss this today is Jean-Marc Dreyfus, a Holocaust historian from Manchester University. Hello. Mm -hmm. Glenn Fedder, a senior fellow at the Institute for the Study of Global Antisemitism and Policy. Leo Sevior, a French rapper and youth worker uh, working here in the suburbs of Paris, I understand. And Rainer Hudemann, the uh, Professor of Contemporary German History in Berlin. And also uh, from uh, Berlin, actually I'm sorry, I do understand he's from Saarbrücken. And also from Germany, Dr Dieter Goswinkel, a legal specialist. But before we begin, Cathy Clifford has more on this symbolic trial. As his trial opened, Oskar Groening asked for forgiveness. One of few suspected Nazi criminals alive to tell the tale, the 93-year-old arrived in court, ready to face trial for complicity in the deaths of 300,000 Jews at Auschwitz concentration camp 70 years ago. Unlike others, he's spoken out openly about his past, he says, to counter Holocaust denial. Though he insists he's not personally guilty of any murders, he now says he feels morally guilty. Dozens of plaintiffs arrived in court with their families. For this Hungarian survivor, it's not about a jail sentence, but rather a last chance to research and deal with Auschwitz crimes. I can ask if he knew Mengele, and that is a very important question for me, because there were files that Mengele created about the experiments. I personally was injected with deadly germ and Mengele stood by my bed, never talking to me, but talking to four doctors, telling them, too bad she's so young, she has only two weeks to live. Under the Nazis, Groening's job was to collect money left in the belongings of Jews going to the gas chambers. Until now, his alleged lack of direct involvement in their deaths kept him out of court. But many felt the German justice system hadn't done enough to prosecute Nazis, with few still alive. The courts are now turning to guards who indirectly aided in mass murder. Groning's trial is the first in this new line of legal reasoning. Justice has failed us over the past five decades by not taking on trials like this that they should have taken on. There are currently 11 cases open against former Auschwitz guards, a legal race against the clock. Jamal, let me start with you. What does one achieve by putting a 93-year-old man on trial. Uh, first, it's a trial of one man. So I don't think it's a trial of Auschwitz. It's not a trial for memory. It's not a trial for history. It's just the normal justice of one man suspected of being a criminal, mass criminal, with no statute of limitation because it's crime, uh, crime against humanity. And we will see what the court decide, judge. But it's a criminal case with a, a very important historical context, isn't it? Um, any, any criminal case you know, on Auschwitz or on the Holocaust has a very important historical context. It is probably the last trial of, or one of the last trials, at least in Germany, of Auschwitz. You know. So that's why it's significant. But for, so far, it's a trial of one man. Glenn, uh, let's just uh, go through some of the specifics of this case, because I understand you know, you're, uh, you in your uh, profession actually follow these uh, trials fairly closely. He served as an SS guard in Auschwitz, where he was responsible for collecting cash belongings to prisoners. Um, but he also witnessed atrocities. He witnessed atrocities. He argues that's his defence. Yeah. Well, I think witnessing... Um is not really the defense. The fact that he was an accessory to murder is the ultimate, um, is the ultimate crime uh, in this trial. Um, this type of crime um, was basically um, 
just, uh, justified in a watershed trial by, uh, in 2012, 2011-2012, um, by John uh, Dzemczyk. And under this trial, the German courts decided to, uh, to try him under uh, the statute of accessory to murder. And so that's what's changed in this case. It, as a result, um, the con I think there could be a probable conviction, which is very important uh, legal and symbolic victory. Yeah, I want to talk about that 2011 case in a moment, but let me just pose a question to Dieter. Given the age of the defendant and also the witnesses, and given the time that has passed, just how difficult is it to hold a trial like this? Certainly um, it is difficult, but it's absolutely necessary, even if the um, prosecuted persons are very old. I witnessed another uh, uh, cause in uh, Toronto against uh, someone who had committed war crimes uh, during uh, the Second World War. He was 93 years old. And for, Canada, for the state of Canada, it was absolutely necessary for symbolic reasons. And this is also the case for the German state. But just, I mean, logistically, it must be very hard. It is. But it was very hard to be a victim under these people. Uh, Rainer, um, Groening was quoted in a Der Spiegel interview as saying that guilt is uh, always connected to deeds. And since he sees himself as not a non-acting guilty party, uh, it does sort of raise questions about individual guilt, doesn't it? Yes, of course. Well, first, the, the process is only one level of the permanent confrontation to Auschwitz in Germany. We can perhaps come back to this later. There are, of course, um, many lacks in the law system after the war, perhaps partly because the judges had been Nazis themselves. There have uh, been um, processes against in the Federal Republic against about 170,000 people. But um, in, initially, there, there was a main problem uh, to judge along democratic uh, law lines, which means prove that somebody had actively participated to murders, which uh, revealed to be rather difficult sometimes. First, the SS people um, uh, always uh, put all the uh, guilt on those who had died during uh, the war. Then a second, um, the documentations were uh, very often in Eastern uh, Europe, the Soviet Union and the German Democratic uh, Republic uh, delivered the, uh, the uh, material only reluctantly and uh, very often falsified, so very difficult to use was an instrument of the uh, Soviet Union to prove that all the Germans were still Nazis, which of course is not the case. Uh, this does not excuse anything, but this uh, explains some of the problems in the beginning. Another problem was that after the war first, the Allies were very suspicious, of course, against German, uh, uh, German courts. And so in the first years, uh, it was the Allies, and particularly also the French, very actively, who led these uh, trials. And um, the um, um, processes in the German responsibility started uh, principally uh, seven year, uh, several years after the war only. These are some aspects who uh, can <clears throat> absolutely not excuse but um, explain some reluctancy. Rainier, but, yeah. uh, just at this point, I want to just turn to Jean-Marc. I mean, one thing it does do, this whole case, it highlights the failure of the German justice system in the past to prosecute people such That's as Groening. That's absolutely sure, yes. <laughs> when you see the number of people who could be, have been accused you know, of direct, you know, very direct crime. I mean, there was somewhere in the order of more than 6,000 SS I've been, guards. I've been, no, 6,000, more than 6,000 Germans stood trial for something like war crimes or the Holocaust, you know, concentration camps and the Holocaust. Many of them were condemned to very light penalty. They were very often set free 
almost immediately after the judgment. So there was a political will in the new German Republic of Germany not to put those people on trial. So some judges tried. So you had some individual judges who started some prosecution. Very often they opened some kind of common case. You know, they called, the, they called it in, in German complex. You know. So you will judge all the people responsible for the deportation of Jews in France. There was such a trial. Or in the Netherlands. Or all the German diplomats who participated in this final solution. But it led to no th nothing. Because for the reason that Rainer Hudemann mentioned, you know, that many of the people in the judicial system were, have been Nazis themselves, or were linked to Nazi, and also it was the, a political, a, a, a policy of the new German Republic by Adenauer himself, you know, to say, we do our share, you know, in the Cold War, don't forget the Cold War, this is very important, we do our share, you know, we pay a lot to, you know, but we maintain stability in Germany, but in exchange, don't ask us to prosecute the Nazis. Ren, it also shows that this, uh, rather, this il trial illustrates the fact that perceptions of the Holocaust and Nazi war crimes have shifted, as uh, Jean-Marc was just saying. And, uh, you know, as a result, we now have a situation where people like Groening are being taken to court. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's too little too late uh, at this point um, this is an historic trial because the, the, uh, the, the Nazi guards, especially, are of a generation that is dying out. I mean, uh, we talked about numbers before. Around 6,500, uh, uh, there were around 6,500 SSS guards. There were only around 65 trials, and out of those, only around 20 to 30 convictions. So it's a very low number. He's in, in, facing a in Auschwitz. In Auschwitz. In Auschwitz. Because you have yeah. you had many more in exactly. other camps, you know. Exactly. Many more, and so if you look at the total numbers, they're very. The conviction uh, rate is very low, um, and even um, what he's facing right now, Groening, is around 15 years, which I think symbolically is absurd. Um, he could be convicted of an accessory to murder of over 300,000 human beings. Mm. So to face a 15-year trial for the accessory to murder of 300,000 human beings, I think, is, um, is inappropriate. And we don't know what he did, because we have his you know, statements, you know. The, the case is very exceptional, because we have a... a, a uh, He's been very public about... He has been very public. This is very unique. Very and this unique is, yeah, very because special. Because the, yeah, the, mm -hmm. the dictator, you know, the, 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 the killers, you know, remain silent in Germany. Mm. So we have a case of a German who publicly stood up and spoke, probably thinking that he will no, never be mm -hmm. judged for that. Uh, Dieter, do you have any response to what's just been said? Um, pardon me, a response to what? Uh, just in terms of what Jean-Marc was just saying. Yes, I, do con I can totally confirm that. And, um, and uh, I think um, in this case, um, this SS guard um, wasn't, let's say, wasn't one of the so-called worst uh, uh, because he was able to speak out uh, and to, to tell about what he had done. Maybe he didn't think that he might be prosecuted and this is due to a change in the German doctrine and jurisprudence uh, after the Demjanjuk trial. And this uh, is quite recent and it took place in, two, uh, in 2011. So, and his confession in the magazine Spiegel was in 2005. At that point, uh, he, uh, he didn't have to face uh, a conviction, but now he has and I think it's good. Leo, you've been sitting here quietly listening to these historians and the thing that intrigues me as a young person, you know, when you read of these stories and you see an elderly, frail man in <coughs> court, how, does, how do you respond to uh, such a trial? Um, I guess we have, uh, he is facing two things, the facts and the law at that time, the German law, and also the symbol. And like... Uh, Mr. said, uh, it's maybe not decent that an old man has to face, of, uh, I don't know, it's, he's in, on the court for 3,000? 300,000. 300,000 uh, people that died. And maybe it's not decent, maybe it's not fair, but he, he, uh, now is the time that 
we have to face fact and in historical fact, but uh, how, how can I say that, like, openly. People died in the very hopeful way uh, under a specific regime at the time, the Nazis. And yes, he is being uh, working with them. So yeah, he has to face it. But now, I'm, I'm curious to know, though, in, in the Paris suburbs and the young people that you yeah. work with, do they understand the historical importance of the Holocaust? Yes, the, the, the importance, yes. But do they really know what, what happened? Why they have to learn it? Why people say that you, have, you don't have to forget that? I don't think so. And as a result, do you think the trials like this are very important? Not for this reason. They are important, just, 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 just justice in general is very important. You made something bad, you have to, you have to face it. Uh, Rainer, I'm just uh, curious to know, what is the younger people in Germany, uh, what, what is their response to a trial like this? It's very, very large, and it's very large since the after-war time. Um, <clears throat> the confrontation to the Nazi past uh, started immediately in the summer of 1945. The Protestant churches declared uh, German uh, culpability in, in um, October 45. But all this happens on several levels. In the first 10, 15 years, there was one important focus on the structure of the Nazi re regime and of... I, I, I yeah. think... Yeah. Oh, we seem to be having uh, technical problems there, uh, Dieter. We'll, we'll get back to you. We're just going to have a, a short break, so do stay with us for the second part of the France 24 debate. <laughs>